of the fallen necessitated God's intervention in human history through the incarnation. Any current tragedy or difficulties that we may be facing likewise necessitates God's intervention in our lives. But he will not impose himself on us, but he waits to be invited into our hearts. This is, <clears throat> um, this can be challenging too. I think we may have uh, an expectation that God is just always going to intervene at the right time for us and our needs. That it's just sort of a default. Um, but what Father Zacharias is saying is that God never imposes himself. Remember, this is a relationship. It's like you're in a relationship with someone who you love. And you wait for them to call, but you never call them. And then you get angry because they're not calling you. And you say, What's, why, why don't they love me anymore? Don't they care? Why aren't they calling me? But we never pick up the phone to do that ourselves. It's the same with God. The exception is that God is waiting there constantly to hear from us. Let me pause there for a second just to give you a chance to maybe think about some of this, but also if you have any questions or thoughts you want to share. You said something at the very beginning of, um, about giving me a different um, the church is everywhere, and everyone on earth is within the church, whether they know it or not, whether baptized or not. I didn't say that. I know you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 because the way I look at people, um, of course, they're my brother or my sister, yes. whether they're in the church or out of the church. So. Yes, as we should. We, as Orthodox Christians and those who are grafted into the church, the body of Christ, through the mystery of holy baptism, um, we are to see all people in the world as our brothers and sisters and to love them as such. Ne never to judge them or to exclude them or to see them outside of anything. This is not how Christ functioned, even in his earthly life. Um, you know, even uh, St. Paisius uh, had spent time at St. Catherine's Monastery in Palestine. And um, he, he deeply loved the Muslims. Now, he would say, well, of course, they're not in the church. Even the church is, the, as I said, the church is present everywhere because you can't separate the bridegroom from the bride. So the church is everywhere. Those, the, but, but it still requires one to be grafted into it as a body that contains some of the mysteries that Christ has given all of us to be participants in all of that, if that makes sense. So God's desire, he has one desire, right? It says in scripture, only one time does it say what God desires. Do you know what it is? <coughs> that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the knowledge of the truth? Wrong question, that's a pilot question. P-I-O-L-A-T. Right? Mm -hmm. What is truth? That was the wrong question. Who is the truth? Christ is truth. God desires that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth is a person who is Christ. And I'll talk a little bit more later about that. But in, in many places, Christ says that he who has seen me has seen the Father. He who knows me knows the Father. Christ, as the second person of the Trinity, one of his distinct characteristics is that he is the one who reveals the Father to the world. And no one can know the Father except through the Son, right? So in that sense, we wouldn't say that everybody is in the church. The church is around them in all places, in all, time, in all, in all things, but it's different to be in it because for that to happen, as Christ said, that one cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born. Yeah. John chapter three. Water is unless he is born. That's what it's translated as in scripture. If you look at it in, in the Greek, the word is anothen. Okay? It's translated as again. We say in the divine liturgy, um, for the peace from above. 
Anothe means above, but it's translated in, 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 most, in almost all the Protestant uh, translations from King James on, uh, unless one is born again. But in the Greek it says, unless one is born from above, this refers now correctly to the heavenly birth of water and the spirit, which is baptism. One cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, Christ says. What is the <coughs> kingdom of heaven? Wrong question. <laughs> Who is the kingdom of heaven? Christ is the kingdom of heaven, right? When Christ was on earth, he says, the kingdom of heaven is among you now, in, in his personhood, in his person as God. So, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Father Timothy. Hopefully, this is going to work. Let's see. Hello? It went off. What time are they trying now? Um, so, back to when you said um, addiction uh, is trying to satisfy like, from a broken relationship, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Could that be from like a Parents, or is it an age like uh, into your early twenties or anything? Yeah. So the Bormate, who he's a he's a medical doctor, um, psychiatrist, Jewish background. Um, he he said that all the root of all addiction is relationship based, right? So all of us have experienced painful past relational things. Um, I would say that the large percentage of those painful past relational experiences come from one of our two or both primary caregivers, which would be our parents, typically. But it can come from others as well, even from you know our earliest infant years. And so we develop a concept of ourself based on the relational experiences we have in our formative years, okay? So I'll give you a very um, easy example. A young boy, <clears throat> uh, as he's growing up, age five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever, let's say his father is telling him um, and showing him that, you know, you're just, you're stupid. You're never gonna amount to anything. I don't even know why we brought you into this world. I mean, just really horrible things. But things, this happens quite, you know, often, unfortunately. Um, so that young boy, as he grows up, and he's receiving this message, in addition to the verbal message, he's also experiencing a, a, deep, a deep lack of uh, intimate connection, of caring and um, connection, um, empathy, all of these things are absent. So as he grows up, what he's been told and what he's experienced now influences the way that he sees himself. He has no worth, he has no value, he's stupid, he's whatever. This then begins to affect the way that he lives life, the choices he makes. His concept of himself influences the way that uh, he functions in society and the world. Um, he may become an overachiever or he may become sort of paralyzed in trying to attempt anything because he knows that he won't succeed because that's really what he's been taught growing up. That's just one example. Um, that would be more emotional and verbal abuse, but there's physical abuse and there's sexual abuse, and all of these things have a, a profound impact on the person's development and ultimately how they see themselves and how they see themselves in relationship to other people. Um, so that's what I mean. So. <clears throat> Oftentimes people, because of the, the pain of that, that's embedded in them and in, in, in those experiences, they, um, they, 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 they begin to engage in things that uh, numb them, uh, forget, right? So you know, someone, let's say, who's using alcohol as, uh, to medicate themselves, a lot of this is uh, unconsciously happening within them. And so they use and they get drunk, and for a while they, they don't feel, you know, the pain that's there. But when they wake up the next morning and they start their day, it's, it's there again. Even if they may not be able to pointedly identify exactly what it is, you know, but they're still, yeah. So that, that's, 
that's kind of how it, how it happens. Okay. Yeah. You had a question back there? Yeah. <laughs> Just be loud. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll take it here. I was going to ask you about baptism and how we accept baptism in other denominations and churches in orthodoxy. I mean, some orthodox don't, based on some of what you were saying. But I also, um, I work with SUVs and I work for the state and licensed behavioral health facilities. And, SUVs. Oh, nice. and so listening to what you're saying, uh, especially about what Gabor Mate said, um, oftentimes it feels so difficult because you just see these problems being treated with medicine and what they call evidence-based methodologies. And you think that, you know, just in my own experience, that what people need is spirit, that they need. Uh, they need the church, they need the divine, yeah. Yeah. repentance. But you don't see that happening. It seems like a kind of a helpless situation. Yeah, I, 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 I feel you. As you say that, I, I I know what your what that experience is like. Um, well, let me let me speak about the second part first. Um, just as uh, individuals can suffer at the hands of others in what is said or what is done or neglect or whatever the case may be in their life. Um, it is also others who can bring healing to them because as they are connecting with someone now who actually is interested in them, is, does care about them, is able to show empathy with them, um, that is a relational experience that is healthy and perhaps new to them, but it also begins to create a healthier understanding of self, okay? So relationships can harm, but they can also heal. And that really is <clears throat> really the key or the essence of a therapeutic relationship, right? Um, this is really <clears throat> at the crux of interpersonal neurobiology, as Dr. Daniel Siegel speaks about, um, that our experience, through every experience we have, we have this sort of neural connection that happens. And the more the experience happens, the same experience happens the more that particular neural network gets strengthened more and more and more and more. So you kind of see it like a, a thin wire, and then maybe two that are wrapped, and then three, and then it, it can become a cable, right? You have these very strong neural networks, these connections in our brain based on the, on the experiences and so forth. The, the, the stronger that that is, uh, the more desperate and, and hurting the person is and hopeless and all of that. However, um, again, going back to this to the personal relationship, an interpersonal relationship with someone else who is in that uh, state, little by little, we, we can just start shaving away one little wire at a time, you know? And you have to remember, it is, it is what the person needs is the church. And we can just say these things synonymously. They need the church, they need grace, they need love, they need kindness, they need all of these things, right? That doesn't mean that they need to come here and be in this church. It means that we must be church to them. You know, we, we are the ones who have to take the light and the fragrance of Christ out into the world and allow that to shine and to exude so people see it and they, they, they smell it in a sense, they, they sense it. Um, this is the most important thing that we can do. That actually is the heart of Orthodox mission is to be Christ in the presence of another person, which then requires that we are working diligently, slowly, little by little, to become more Christ-like. And again, you're gonna hear this later, we, we do this not for my salvation, I don't do this for my salvation only. I do it so that I can be obedient to Christ to bring salvation to other people not by what I can say or how I can argue theology or how I can prove something that's different about orthodoxy and Gnosticism or orthodoxy and Protestantism or whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> none of that. None of that. I have to tell you a funny story. <laughs> it's 
So my, my uh, Venusi Ted has in, been in Greece for the last five weeks. Um, I'm fine. Just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> well, is she safe? Huh? Is she safe? She is. I mean, yeah, are you uh, wondering they, constantly? They, well, they got they got hit by that hurricane Daniel that came up through <coughs> and hit part of Israel and across the Mediterranean. Yeah, they, it was devastating. But thank you for asking. Um, so I called an Uber, and I get in the car, and it's a, a young guy. I mean, I'd say, gosh, mid twenties at best, dark hair, accent. And so we, we start driving, and usually Uber drivers won't talk because they just respect quiet and silence, you know, typically. So I, I started the conversation, you know. I said, um, so have you been driving an Uber long? You know, he looks young. He goes, yeah, it's, uh, it's my second week. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's awesome. I said, good for you. I said, that's great. I said, how do you like it? He says, I like it, I like it. Um, and so we, we had a little bit a little bit more of exchange and he keeps looking in his rear rear view mirror and he says uh, you look like a Turkish uh, mafia <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have my robe on <laughs> and I said no I'm not I'm not Turkish I said I'm, I'm Greek I'm half Greek I said my father was from Catalonia, and my mother actually is, was born and raised in Berlin, Germany. So I'm half and half. And he goes, oh, you're Greek. I go, yeah. And then, um, I don't know how it came up, but he said, he says, I'm from Turkey. Oh. And um, I said, oh, really? I said, um, I said, you know, I've been to, I've been to Istanbul, what we still refer to as Constantinople, uh, a couple of times. and. And, and so forth, and, and then he says, well, have you been to Greece? I said, I've been to Greece several times. And he said, well, what, what do you think is different between the two? And I said, well, you know, I'm talking about, they're talking about culture, he's talking about culture. <coughs> anyway, he, he was very, once he found out that I was part Greek, he, he became uh, kind of like this, you know? And so he says, yeah, he says, <coughs> He, he talked about their current president, how you know, most people don't care for him, and, and he talked about the history and the wars and the Greeks and the Turks and on and on. He says, you know, it just it saddens me that this is my history. And I said, yeah, I said, me too. I said, I know there's a lot of anger and, and deep, deep, deep bitterness and even hatred uh, among some still in those two countries. I said, but that doesn't mean that we have to continue that. I said, I don't care what country you're from, personally, or what your country's history is. I said, it, it, it doesn't affect me whatsoever in terms of how I see you as a person. I said, I, I'm actually very, very impressed that you are in this country trying to make a life for yourself, you know? And um, we had this beautiful conversation. Um, I didn't tell him I was a priest. Um, we just continued to talk. And, um, and then about halfway to the airport, he says, do you mind if I play some Greek music? I love Greek music. <laughs> and I said, absolutely. Yeah. He goes, <clears throat> he goes <clears throat> I couldn't do this you know, back home in Turkey, but so he starts, he pulls up his Spotify playlist and he starts playing Greek music, you know? And, uh, and we continue to have our conversation. And then he says, you know, I, I, uh, I have some friends from Turkey here too, and, um, I would listen to my music um, in my car and then I'd go in, but I, I couldn't play it, you know, because I don't want them to think, you know, we're Turks and they're Greeks and they're whatever. And, he, and then he says, and the four of them, he says, I found out when I walked in, they were listening to Greek music. <laughs> I said, well, there you go. I said, that's a start. So anyway. Um, I'm not sure where that came from based on the last question. Um, I, I think he was probably in his mid-twenties, very young. We were talking so much, we, we, we missed the, the first exit. And he, he says, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, you're still getting five stars, that's good. I said, by the way, I said, in, in the valley here, you can miss one or two or three exits and you'll still find one that'll take you there, so don't worry about it, we're good. 
and uh, so it was it was really really nice. Um, as far as your first question goes, uh, in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, the accepted uh, practice is to um, to bring people into the church who are of a recognized faith, and they have a list of those faiths, uh, usually mainline Protestants and Catholics, um, and and some others, um, and and to to bring them in through chrismation only. So that's the current uh, practice in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. Now that practice comes out of a, of a, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but that practice came out of, a, of an ecumenical dialogue where they developed a document called the BEM document, the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry Doctrine uh, document, which, in which they were, uh, you know, many uh, uh, Christian denominations were coming together to try to bring some more closeness between them. Um, that's, that's very hard to do on a theological basis though, because orthodoxy cannot compromise or change anything. I mean, the minute that happened in the 11th century, you had the great schism. So you, you, can't, you can't play around with doctrine and dogma and things like that. Um, in that document, though, one of the things was is that the, uh, the, the representatives of the Greek Orthodox Church, the representatives that were sent, uh, had uh, come, with, come up with this agreement and they presented it and it was accepted at the, at the highest level that anybody who is among this pool of Christians outside of Orthodoxy, um, if they use water and, 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 they, and, they, and the name of the Trinity, then that would be considered a baptism uh, through what we call economia, meaning it's a bending of a rule, okay? So the practice is actually a practice of economia, but the, the rule, the standard practice, is always to receive people by baptism into the Orthodox Church because there's only one holy Catholic and apostolic church, there's only one baptism and one Eucharist and one, you know, it's this, this, this oneness is found in Christ and the apostles, uh, the church that's established on Pentecost and through the ecumenical councils and teachings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to keep the church as one and whole. Catholici means whole, complete, full, lacking nothing, okay? And in fact, it was taught to me that chrismation would fulfill any of that which was lacking in their baptisms. So when, we, when a person says, we don't rebaptize. that's true. We would never baptize someone who is baptized in the Orthodox Church and baptize them again. But to call something rebaptism to me, is a misnomer. If there's only one baptism, then you're not rebaptizing. you're baptizing them. And, you know, um, and I know there are some people who come from these, uh, some of these accepted uh, faith denominations, um, and I know some priests will uh, allow them, uh, or yeah, allow them to to be baptized if they really feel insistent upon that and they see it sort of theologically outside of the, of the ecumenical dialogue parameters that were set, you know, and that becomes sort of a pastoral thing and it's, it's been difficult in the, in the church, you know, for a, a few years. Um, but yeah, I don't know, hopefully that will yeah. help you somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to the issue of addiction and it being based in relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I've lived a good part of my life with people who are addicted to mm -hmm. drugs and alcohol. And uh, particularly African American and Native American people who hear negativity constantly coming from white people. Mm -hmm. Not all of white mm -hmm. people, but the culture itself is condemning yeah. them. Yeah. And uh, in caring for people like that, um, of course, I'm dealing with the history of white people against Native American people. There's a whole tragic tragedy mm -hmm. there. But the other thing is, you did suggest that it's possible to separate ourselves from that tragic history and be representatives of Christ in this relationship. So that mm -hmm. um, currently I'm taking care of a Native American, mm -hmm. and uh, for some reason he trusts me. Um, beyond my understanding. I don't know what gets through to him, but when he brings up the issue of what the culture, the white culture has done to him, and I um, bring that into his struggling with his addiction, um, it's 
things we have to say, don't let the white man's disease kill you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gets through to him. He is going into detox, thanks be to God, mm -hmm. um, Monday or Tuesday. So, yeah. um, but we need to change how we see people of different color, different culture. And we need to really be clear that we are not identifying with the culture that condemns them or sees them as right. oppressor. Right. So, is there anything you can say? Well, I think you're just illustrating what uh, you know. What I said earlier, that just as uh, harm and, and distortion of perspective of self was uh, developed over time through uh, the experiences of other people, that the healing is being experienced by him through you, who are a white person, and you're not uh, not only not interested, but would never want to be a representative of the, the way the thought was back then when these people were being treated so brutally. And so you're loving him, and he's experiencing the love of Christ through you by a person who is a part of a people that were persecuted his people. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now you're showing him that it is possible, that this, this is something very different. And thanks be to God, he's getting now the right representation of not even a, a color, but of humanity, of humanity. This is how we become truly human in our relationship with other people. You're simply being truly human, or maybe much more human than what he had ever experienced before. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> let me try to get back uh, on this here for a minute. Um, 15 minutes? Okay. <coughs> this always happens. This is a good thing. I'm not worried about getting through the text as much as I am just talking with you all. St. Athanasius the Great said, um, it was our sorry case. <laughs> that seems so contemporary. But the language is so contemporary. It was our sorry case that caused the word to come down. Our transgressions, they called out his love for us so that he made haste to help us and to appear to us. It was, it was we who were the cause of his taking human form, and for our salvation that in his great love he was both born and manifested in our human body. For God had made man and had willed that he should remain incorruptible. This was the design of God for us. But men having turned from the contemplation of God to evil, to their own devising, had come inevitably under the law of death. Instead of remaining in the state in which God had created them, they were in the process of becoming corrupted entirely, and death had them completely under its dominion. For the transgression of the commandment was making them turn back again to their nature. And as they had at the beginning come into being out of non-existence, so were they now on the way to returning through corruption to non-existence again. By nature, of course, man is mortal, since he was made from nothing. But he also bears the likeness of him who is and if he preserves that likeness through constant contemplation, then his nature is deprived of its power and he remains incorrupt. So the event of the incarnation is what is and has accomplished. Uh, the perp it's, it's been accomplished, the purpose has been accomplished uh, for our salvation. However, each person, each one of us must permit the incarnation to become a living reality in our heart. Did Christ not say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. Love asks for permission to abide in us. Christ is love. But he asks permission to abide in us, even though the condition of our house and our hearts are usually in utter disarray. And a point of emphasis from the quote by St. Athanasius, which I think is very important to underline, is that our transgressions called out his love to us. I think we lost the mic. Yeah. It was our transgressions that called out his love for us, so that he made haste to help us and to come and appear among us. As it says in the baptismal service, he could not endure to see the human race under the tyranny of the devil. God looking upon us could not stand to see this that we are in 